and welcome to Read It Bomb. Um, again, uh, this is Read It Bomb, uh, Bomb meeting the Book of Mormon. On this channel, we read the Book of Mormon and we talk about its teachings and the teachings of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. Um, so this is the kind of, uh, I guess, setting that works well for me doing these live events or, um, I guess, uh, live streams, and then they're saved as videos on the channel. And it's something I can do, I guess, at night when um, my child is asleep and I have more time. And yeah, so it works well. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about um, original sin. Um, we're going to be talking about aspects of Christ's grace and what his atonement um, has done for us, um, or I guess maybe just one part of what his atonement did for us. And we're also going to be talking about personal responsibility. So we're going to try to talk, um, or at least uh, reach or touch on each one of those subjects. Okay. Um, so please uh, go ahead and um, during the video, like, comment, um, subscribe to the channel. If I say something that you don't agree with, please leave me a comment. Let me know if I say something that you agree with. If there's something that stands out to you during the channel, please also comment that uh, below and I can um, maybe give you more references, uh, give you more scriptures to look up, stuff like that. Um, that would be nice uh, to have uh, some interaction with y'all and see what your thoughts are on um, on the topics. So um, was there something else I wanted to talk about? No? Okay, so we're going to start. Um so original sin is something that is, uh, I guess, a very important issue to understand because the idea of original sin deeply affects or has um, great impact on Christian theology. Okay, so if you believe that when someone is born, they're an evil, vile, vile sinner— and if they die, they're going to go to hell, you know, if they die as a child or let's say, um, yeah, and they haven't even done anything, then, you know, that that makes a statement about, you know, who God is, who Christ is and what Christianity is. And there are some people who believe that. Um, I think more maybe in, in the past and now there are uh, some denominations who probably believe that previously are trying to uh, understand it a little bit differently because it's a hard understanding. Um but that's what original sin is. So original sin says basically because of the fall, um, Adam fell and everybody who's born is born in a sinner. Okay. Um, so I'm going to explain by reading scriptures, the, uh, the Latter-day Saint viewpoint on this. And it's definitely not that. Okay. We don't believe that people are born sinners. We believe that everybody sins. We believe that we are um, have a fallen nature, but we do not believe that people are born sinners. And um, so that's just important to know. I wanted to state that from the onset. Okay, now talking about Christ's grace, we're going to, um, I don't want to give everything away at, uh, at the beginning, but we're going to talk about some aspects of uh, the atonement that uh, affect and I would say resolve original sin, um, at least in the LDS aspect. This is how we believe it. So um, that's a part of Christ's grace, right? It's something he did. It's unmerited by us, and it affects us greatly, okay? Because we, we aren't, in that Latter-day Saint view, we aren't born, as other people think, vile sinners, okay? Where, like I said, if we die as a baby, if we die as a toddler, we die as a... Um, you know, like a, a seven-year-old, eight-year-old, something like that, we're automatically going to hell. No, um, we do not believe that. Uh, so, well, if we didn't accept Christ, it would be going to hell. Okay. Um, we, we don't understand that. So talking about Christ's grace, let's uh, go over here to, um, what is it, gotquestions.com. It's like a Christian site. And it's going to show two different kind of, uh, well, I guess the two most popular understandings of grace um, in 
Protestant Christianity at the moment. So let me go ahead and share this screen so we can see it. <clears throat> uh, right here. Share. Okay, let me just make sure we can see this. Yes, we can. Let's make it bigger. There we go. Okay, so got questions right here. What is uh, prevenient grace? Okay, so it says prevenient grace is a phrase used to describe the grace given by God that precedes the act of a sinner exercising saving faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, so basically the understanding of this is because people are evil, awful, awful sinners, in that state, they cannot come to Christ. They cannot freely come to Christ in that state because their whole nature is sinning. They literally, by nature, reject Christ. Okay, this is what many, many, many Christians believe. Okay, I'm not going to list all the ones that believe it because I don't want to mess up or I don't, I don't know um, how many people reject this, but I would say the majority of Christianity believes that we're born sinners and the nature that one receives when receiving uh, or when born is basically rejecting Christ. You, you Rejecting the God, rejecting Christ, you cannot come to Christ in that state, okay, because of the doctrine of original sin. So here, uh, prevenient grace, what it is, is it is saying that before somebody comes to Christ, because you can't do that because your nature literally stops you from doing that. You, you, you can't get past it. You can't come to Christ no, no matter how hard, how, how hard you want to, because literally you would never imagine that. Okay. So it says people who come to Christ, they do it because God has sent his grace or God's grace has gone before you even started exercising faith in Christ. And it's changed you in a way so that you can exercise faith in Christ. That's my best understanding of it. That's my best definition of it. Now, this is more of the Methodist um, view of it, and I guess you would say the free will Baptist view of it, is that it is a, a prevenient grace, right? So it's something that goes before um, you accept Christ, and it helps change your nature, change your desires, so that you can accept Christ. Um, but prevenient grace is something you can also reject, okay? It's not something that because God did this work in you, you're automatically saved no matter what, right? It is, if you walk away from it or if you reject it, you will not reach uh, salvation, okay? Or you will not be saved in the end. Now, down here, um, it also talks about, uh, it says right here, um, the Reformed doctrine of irresistible grace is a type of prevenient grace. Okay, so irresistible grace is a little bit different. It, it, it functions the same where it believes that it's in the belief that we're born with this original sin or with this, they call it total depravity because of original sin, because of the fall, where we literally can't do any good, okay? Meaning we can't in any way do anything pleasing to God. So in order to do something pleasing to God, to come unto him, to be able to accept Christ, to do anything pleasing to God, God has to send his grace. So it sounds very similar to prevenient grace, right? Because it's a form of that. But irresistible grace means when God does that, when he reaches out and touches you and changes your nature, you cannot resist it. Okay. Why? Because um, sorry, uh, Calvinists have this idea that what God does, he can never fail in, right? Which is true, but they take that to saying God reaches out and touches you. You're saved automatically because of that, basically, and because he reached out and touched you and changed your nature, you're never going to walk away, right? He did that, and it changed your desires, and your desires will never allow you from that point to walk away. So that's the two main understandings of uh, grace in this aspect, okay? And um, we're going to talk about now the LDS view of it. And if we had to decide which one of these, the LDS view, I guess, most likely, um, uh, sorry, I couldn't think of the word, but most likely resembles, there we go. It would be uh, the free will Baptist Methodist view of prevenient grace, but it's not 
in the same way. Okay, we're going to read the Book of Mormon and we're going to understand how this works. What is working um, behind the scenes in order to, um, well, yeah, in order to be this thing that's similar to prevenient grace. But it's it's not in a way. I'm going to say it's not prevenient grace, but in a way between the two, it would be most similar to that one. Hopefully that it wasn't confusing. I was just trying to give you all a little bit of understanding of, you know, somewhat of the Christian Protestant doctrines concerning grace. And now we're going to dive into LDS understanding of um, original sin, of grace, of Christ's grace, and of uh, personal responsibility. Okay. Um, because, just a side note, irresistible grace and all of the tulip doctrine, which is um, basically Calvinist doctrine, it all destroys personal responsibility. It does, okay? Because God touches you, and as soon as he touches you, he changes you in a way where you cannot do anything outside of his uh, uh, outside of his will, meaning you cannot do anything that would make you walk away from him. Okay. Completely destroys free will, completely destroys personal responsibility. And just letting you know, the LDS belief is we have free will and God will never do anything to destroy that. He has given us that in order so that we can show him how much we love, trust, and um, believe in him, right? So he will never, never do anything to jeopardize our free will. That's um, when in doubt, if you need an understanding for something, that is the understanding. God and the LDS understanding will never do anything to jeopardize or destroy or um, take away our free will. He, he gives us free will so that we can absolutely use that in deciding to come to him and to accept Christ or not. So there's that. Okay. So we're going to jump now to um, right here. This is the Articles of Faith of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And we're going to be focusing on the second one. Okay. So <clears throat> the second one says... We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. Okay, so this is a very, very theologically packed statement, right? It might be one sentence. It might seem, especially if you've learned these things since your, you know, your childhood in primary, but this is a very important statement. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. OK, in other words, we don't believe in sin that is passed down where you're born and you're born an awful evil, evil sinner. We don't believe in that. OK, all sins are due to each individual's actions. They have free agency and they've used that free agency against the counsels of God, against the commandments of God, doing something contrary to what God has declared. And therefore, they have sinned. Okay, it's not because, well, they were born an evil, awful, awful sinner, and so they couldn't help but but sin. No, it's because they, yes, we have a fallen nature, and we'll get to that. But they themselves have decided to uh, freely sin, um, and they could decide not to but they decide to do it. And that is why they're punished for their own sins and not for the sins of Adam's transgression. Okay. So let us hop into the book of Mormon. Okay. We're going to start sharing this slide and guys, let me just tell you something. This is second Nephi two. Okay. Second Nephi two is one of the most amazing chapters in the book of Mormon. I have to say it, it has so many amazing, um, verses in it has so much amazing um, teaching, so many amazing teachings in it, and I really enjoy this verse. So we're just going to start with um, what is it, six through eight, okay? And this is going to set the mood for what we're going to talk about um, and what we're going to be reading in the Book of Mormon. 
Okay. So, wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah. The Holy Messiah obviously being Jesus Christ. For he is full of grace and truth. Okay? Every, every Christian can agree with this statement. Wherefore, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. Verse 7. Behold, he offereth himself a, a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law. Okay? Unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Okay, so like I said, we're going to be talking about um, uh, personal responsibility. Okay, and what I mean by that is basically us having to meet the conditions that Christ has set for salvation. Okay, so we're going to be reading some of those today. But for example, right here, okay. We know that we have to believe in Christ in order to be saved. That is a condition. If we do not believe in him, we can't be saved. And any any Christian um, will believe in that, will, you know, will agree with that. That is a condition, okay? We know through the restored gospel that there are other conditions, namely following the gospel of Jesus Christ, being faith, repentance, baptism, receiving the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end, okay? Those are the conditions by which we receive uh, salvation. That, that's how we show Christ that we accept him, okay? So, right here, it says, Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law, okay? Now, here's their personal responsibility. Unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Okay? But what if we don't have a broken heart or contrite spirit? Well, it says, and unto none else can the ends of the law be met. Okay? The ends of the law mean you're not going to be punished for your sins. You're, that it means you're going to be in good standing before God at the last day. Okay? So only to those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And I take that to mean all those who follow Christ and all those who does uh, who do what he says okay if we follow Christ we follow his word we follow his gospel he's going to um he w will have met the ends of the law for us and we will be as it says in the book of mormon um we'll be able to stand with clean garments before god and we won't have the stained garments with uh, sin and abomination and all this. No, our garments will be cleaned through the blood of the Lamb of God, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's read eight. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth. I love that, okay? You read verse seven, right? Christ, he makes himself a sacrifice, but it's only to those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else, can the ends of the law be answered? And then just the beginning of verse eight, wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, right? So if there's a condition, and that is we have to follow Christ in order to be saved, then how great is it the, the importance to let people know you have to go follow Christ? I just love that. Okay. Um, and how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, okay? Save it be through the merits, the mercy, and the grace of the Holy Messiah. Okay, so let's read that again. That they may know that there can be no flesh, that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits, the mercy, and the grace of the Holy Messiah, okay? So this is in the Book of Mormon. This is what we believe. No one can stand before God, okay, unless it be through the merits, mercy, and grace of Jesus Christ. That's what we believe, okay? There's probably many Christians who say we don't believe that, okay? They're wrong. Only in and through Christ 
like it says up here, redemption cometh in and through the Holy Messiah. Okay. Only through his merits, mercy, and grace are we able to stand before God at the last day. But here's the thing. That doesn't mean he take he took away our personal responsibility. This co- kind of goes back to the video I said before. We have to do all we can do. Okay, the video I made, what was it, um, a couple nights ago, talking about, um, I I said uh, the most quoted verse by anti Mormon Christians, which is Second um, Nephi twenty five twenty three. Okay, because they say, oh, it says after all you can do. Yes. Okay, please go watch the video. I'll try to add a link here somewhere. Um, It says, after all we can do, and what does that mean? That means we have to believe in Christ and be reconciled to God. Okay, what does that mean? That means we have to meet the conditions that Christ set forth. We have to believe in him. Okay, we have to follow his gospel. We have to repent and be baptized. Okay, and we have to endure to the end in our faith to Christ. Okay, we can't turn our back on. And why is that sufficient? Because it's all through the merits, mercy, and grace of Christ, okay? There's nothing else besides going through Christ that will get us into heaven. There's no other way. We have to do what Christ tells us to do, and we will get into heaven. Okay. And then right here it just says, um, uh, The Holy Messiah who layeth down his life according to the flesh and taketh up again by the power of the spirit that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead being the first that should rise okay that was just to finish the verse okay so we're going to hop down to verse 25 okay you're missing all the good stuff in between i invite you to go read it that's why it's called read it bomb Uh, i guess 24 that's where i should have said um okay so now we're getting into I, i know i go off on tangents i'm sorry okay it's 20 it's 20 we're 21 minutes in okay i'm gonna try to not make this one this video is so long, so I won't be going off on, on too many tangents. But, um, so we're getting into now, um, specifically what I want to talk about, thinking about original sin, thinking about um, what aspect of the atonement corrects original sin for us, okay? That what you could say is a somewhat of a prevenient, a prevenient grace. Okay. Um, I might be saying that wrong. I'm sorry that word, but uh, we're going to see what the Book of Mormon teaches, uh, what happens and how we know that we're not born with original sin. Okay. So 24, but behold, all things have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. Okay. It's talking about God, all things, have been done in the wisdom of him who knoweth all things. 25. Adam fell that men might be, men are that they uh, might have joy. 26. And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. <clears throat> so let's stop there. I want because this verse is is really important. So if you just stop there, right, you'd be like, yeah, you know, Christ comes and and he redeems uh, us from sin, and uh, we will uh, be able to, like like I was saying before, we'll be able to accept him, and uh, we'll be able to follow him, and, and through him we'll be saved, okay? But is that what redeemed means in this verse at that moment, okay? So in this verse, what does redeemed mean? Is it talking about saving us from our sins, or is it talking about maybe um not specifically just the act of the the atonement is it talking about something else so let's break it down and it you know hint it's talking about something else in a way okay and I'm, it's this is very important for the topic we're talking about in this video okay and the messiah cometh in the fullness of times so that he may redeem the children of men from the fall okay and because they are redeemed from the fall they have become free forever. Now, if you stop there, you're like, yeah, you know, if we're redeemed from our sins, then we're free forever. Cool. Well, but let's go on, okay? And because they are redeemed from the fall, um, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and to not be acted upon. Save it be by the punishment of the law at the great and last day according to the commandments which God has given. Okay, 
Now, that last part of that verse doesn't really make sense. If redeemed means he's saving us from our sins, right? So, because how can Christ come and redeem us from the fall? And then at the end of that verse, it says, well, we might be punished because of uh, our sins. That's basically what it means. Save it be the punishment of the law at the great and last day. Okay, according to commandments, which uh, God hath given. That means um, we we would have sinned, and because of sin, uh, we would have to be punished by the law of God, basically. Okay, so in this verse, redeemed isn't talking about the act of the atonement in the way that we usually say, okay, um, Christ is going to save us from our sins. No, redeemed me is specifically talking about the effects of the fall. Hopefully, I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm not losing you here, but so it says, and the Messiah cometh in the fullness of times that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. Okay. And because they're redeemed from the fall, they're now free, free, what free to choose. We're going to see that in the next verse. They know good and evil now because Adam and Eve, by taking the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they got that and then they fell. Okay. But Christ comes to redeem men from the fall. Okay, it means no longer is the effect of the fall, meaning original sin, have effect on men. Okay, this is the grace. Okay, that God, that through Christ, God has given us. We are not born with original sin. Why? Through this grace of Jesus Christ. Okay, it's not prevenient grace because prevenient grace says. Okay, well, we're born sinners, but before we come to Christ um, in our lives, before we make that decision, grace comes along and it changes our heart. Okay, no, this is something that through Christ's infinite atonement goes back infinitely to, you know, the first humans and goes forward to the last. It means that through Jesus Christ, the effects of of original sin are null and void and don't have they don't have any effect on humans okay because of christ's atonement which is amazing so we believe that this grace this thing that he did this unmerited thing has affected all humans and that no one is born with original sin because he as it says here redeemed the children of men from the fall so 27 is going to build on this wherefore men are free according to the flesh and all things are given them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great meteor of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the cap captivity and power of the devil, for he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. So 27 makes my case for what 26 means. How can Christ come and redeem us from our sins, if that's what it was supposed to mean, and then in 27 say, but we still have to choose to accept him or to accept the devil, right? That's not what it means, okay? Redeem in this in this aspect, in 26, specifically talking about this act of grace of Christ redeeming us from the fall, the effects of the fall, and it being the effect of original sin, okay? Because there are other effects of the fall that we still have, right? We we still have somewhat of a fallen, uh, we still have like a fallen nature, right? Everyone's going to sin. Because of the fall, sin entered into the world, okay? He didn't get rid of sin, but he did get rid of you being born as an evil, awful sinner, okay? He didn't get rid of death. That's another effect of the fall, okay? But this verse right here explains, and I'm going to follow this up with one that is literally just going to, you know, hit us in the face with it after this, but it literally explains that that is what this redeemed means. He redeems us from the effect of original sin. And I'm so thankful for my, uh, for my savior, Jesus Christ for, for doing that. Okay. I really am. Um, so yeah, we've, we talked about this one. He comes to redeem the children, um, of men from the fall and, but yet we could still be punished at the last day, and yet we still have to choose between Christ or the devil. So it's talking about redeeming us from the effects of original sin. Okay. Um, it's been like 30 minutes. Let's continue to this one. Okay, is it up? 
Yes. Okay. So this is Mosiah 3. Okay. And um, Mosiah 3, we are going to read verses 16 through 19. Okay. Um, yeah. 16. And even if it were possible that little children could sin, they could not be saved. Okay. So it's saying, right, that if little children could sin, they could not be saved, if it were possible. Okay, but then it says, but I say unto you, they are blessed. For behold, as in Adam, or by nature they fall, even so the blood of Christ atoneth for their sins. Okay, this is, this is talking about children. So, they are blessed, children are blessed, for as in Adam, or by nature they fall, even so by the blood of Christ, um, sorry, even so the blood of Christ atoneth for their sins. 17, and moreover I say unto you, that there shall be no other name given, nor any other me, uh, uh, nor any other way, nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord omnipotent. Okay. Like I said before, only through Christ, like second, if I said, it's only through Christ that we can be saved. 18 for behold, he judgeth and his judgment is just and the infant perish, uh, perisheth not that dieth in his infancy. Okay. We're not born with original sin because if we were, like it said here, if children could sin, they couldn't be saved if they died. Okay. Here it literally hits us in the face. The infant that perisheth not, uh, the infant perisheth not that dieth in his infancy. But men drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves and become as little children and believe that salvation was and is and is to come in and through the atoning blood of Christ, the Lord omnipotent. Okay. So, the infant that perisheth or that dies in as a baby, okay, doesn't doesn't go to hell. That's what this says. Why? Because Christ atoneth for their sins. Christ took away the effect of original sin for us. Okay. And then it says, but men drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves and become as little children. So we still have personal responsibility because we drink damnation to our own souls. Okay. We can still sin. We still have a sin nature as the next verse is going to say. Okay. We, it says, for the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Jesus Christ, uh, sorry, Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him even as a child doth submit to his father. Okay, so the natural man is an enemy to God. Okay, naturally, and it says from the fall of Adam, right? Naturally, we want to sin. That's I mean, We have a tendency to sin. We want to go and we want to do what we want. We don't want to be locked down by the commandments of God. We don't want to be locked down or, you know, um, naturally, we don't want to humble ourselves and say, you know, God be our king, be our God, and we'll do what you want. No, naturally, we don't want to do that. So we still have this natural man. Christ didn't get rid of that, but he did get rid of original sin where we're not born evil sinners, but we, you know, because of the fall, sins in the world. So according to our own free will and the fact that, you know, no one wants to be tied down, Natural man, the natural man is an enemy to God. 
Okay. We don't have a tendency. Uh, we have a tendency to just do what we want. And the flesh is weak. Even the spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. So what other grace does God give? He sends his Holy Spirit to entice us. Okay. We have free agency. So we're being enticed by the devil and the flesh, which is weak, t- tends to want to do that because a, the devil tells us to do stuff. And he tempts us with gratifying things, with sexual things, right? With things that give us uh, pleasure, like drugs, like alcohol, like, like I said, like sex, all these things. And on the other hand, the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit also entices us. Okay, so we being free from original sin, we have the ability. We're not totally depraved. Okay, we're not just evil, awful sinners when we're born. We have the ability, and like it said in um, 2 Nephi, we're free to act and not just be acted upon. So we can act and we can follow the enticing of the devil or we can follow the enticings of the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is another show of the grace of God. Okay. He sends his Holy Spirit and it entices us to do good. And we have the ability to accept the Holy Spirit. We have ability to follow those enticements. And at times it's hard. And at times, well, not at times, we're always going to fail. But no matter how many times we fail, okay, we can always come back and repent with sincerity of heart and be completely cleansed from sin. Okay. Um, let us move on to the next one. Okay. Um, let me take that off. I'm going to share this one. Okay. We are now in Moroni 8. Okay. So Moroni 8, this whole chapter talks about, like, the subject of this chapter is how little children should not be baptized. Little children don't need to be baptized. Why? For the exact reason we've already talked about. Okay? We just read in Mosiah 3, the infant that perisheth, uh, sorry, the infant perisheth not um, that dieth in his infancy, or the child perisheth not that dieth dieth in his infancy. Okay? It means they're not sinners. Okay? The only way to die and to not go to hell is... If you're clean from sin. And as it said in Mosiah 3, the blood of Christ atones or takes care of the sins of little children. Now, what does that mean? Okay, that that goes, to be fair, let me state this. This is something I need to say. That goes also beyond original sin. Okay. We also believe that there's an age of accountability. Okay. And through modern revelation, we believe that is eight. Okay. So, We believe that when you're eight, you need to be baptized apart from that age because you can, as it says in this chapter, um, uh, baptism is only for people who need repentance or who can repent. And we believe that apart from about eight, that is when you can start actually fully knowing right from wrong. Um, And obviously not fully, but enough to understand I did something wrong, I did something right. And obviously, um, it's as it says, uh, Christ atones for the sins of people before that. So if you pass away before that, um, your sins are taken care of through the grace of Christ. Um, so there's that. Now, well, what if an eight-year-old passes away? I obviously don't think that there's going to be an eight-year-old in hell. Okay, God is a very just God, and so there's... There's things to go with that, but there has to be a, a time set where it says, okay, a, a, um, apart from or after this time, people should start getting baptized, and from modern revelation, that's eight. Okay, so that's what that's what we believe on that subject. Okay, hopefully that wasn't confusing, but let's talk about this. So we're going to start in verse eight. Okay, and this is what it says, and this is an epistle. Okay, this is... The person who is speaking here is the prophet Mormon who's writing this to his son Moroni. That's why it's in Moroni, because Moroni said, hey, my dad wrote me this, and I'm going to put it in here. Okay, 
So Mormon's a prophet, and he's saying how by the power, like it says right here, and the word of the Lord came to me by the power of the Holy Ghost, saying, okay, verse 8, listen to the words of Christ, your Redeemer, your Lord and your God. Behold, I came into the world not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The whole need no uh, physician, but they, but they that are sick, okay, wherefore little children are whole. They are not capable of committing sin. Wherefore, the curse of Adam is taken from them in me, that it hath no power over them. And the law of circumcision is done away in me. And after this manner did the Holy Ghost manifest the word of God unto me. Wherefore, my beloved son, I know that it is solemn mockery before God that ye should baptize little children. Behold, I say unto you, that this thing shall ye teach, repentance and baptism, unto those who are accountable and capable of committing sin. Yea, teach parents that they must repent and be baptized and humble themselves as their little children. And they shall be blessed with their little, oh, sorry, and they shall be saved with their little children. Okay? I like that. And it kind of, it kind of, it's kind of like grubbing it in the face of the people who at this time when he was writing this thought this, it says, well, you know, because throughout the Book of Mormon, Christ says, and humble yourselves as a little child. Okay. So if we're, if we're trying to emulate little children and people think, well, they're, you know, little children need repentance. They're not holy. Why would Christ tell us to emulate them and be as little children? And I like this. He says, right. You teach parents that they must repent and be baptized and humble themselves as their little children. And they shall be saved with their little children, because their little children um, are sinless. Okay. Uh, going to verse 12. And their little children need no repentance, neither baptism, because baptism is unto repentance to the fulfilling uh, to the fulfilling the commandments unto the remission of sins. But little children are alive in Christ, even from the foundation of the world. If not so, this is very important, God is a partial God and also a changeable God, and a respecter of persons. Now, we know God is no respecter of persons, right? We know that from both the Bible and the Book of Mormon. But he says God would be a respecter of persons, okay, if little children were not alive in Christ, if little children were sinners. Why? Because it says, for how many little children have died without baptism? Okay. If a child literally can do nothing, right? Little children, they can't do anything. They don't know what they're doing. And if you baptize one, you say, okay, well, this one that's baptized, even though it can't do anything, we did it for it. If if this little child dies, it's not going to hell. But that little child over there who's not baptized, even though that little child can't do anything like this one that has been baptized, if that one dies, it is going to hell, right? So it says... That th this is why it says it's solemn mockery. Okay, this is why it says that God would be a partial, changeable, and respecter of persons, because how many little children with the same abilities as baptized have died without it? Okay, but we know that God doesn't require children to be baptized because why? They are alive in Christ. The blood of Christ atones for their sins. The blood of Christ takes away this original sin. Okay. And then we're going to go down to 19 and 20. Okay, 19 and 20. Um, little children cannot repent. Okay, remember up, what we just read up there, and the verses we just read, it said that only those who can repent need to be baptized. Okay, here it says little children cannot repent. Wherefore, it is awful wickedness to, de to deny the pure mercies of God unto them. For they are all alive in him because of his mercy. Okay, this is talking about grace. Okay, little children can't repent because they can't do anything right, really. They don't know what they're doing. So to deny them the mercy and deny them the grace of God, saying that, you know, God will take care of them and won't let them go into hell, that's, that's wickedness. That's what it's saying, because it is. Uh, 20. 
And he that saith that little children need baptism denieth the mercies or grace of Christ. Wow, that's powerful. And setteth at naught the atonement of him and the power of his redemption. And this is kind of what we were talking about before. The atonement of Jesus Christ, one of his effects, as we read in 2 Nephi 2, redeems us from the fall in the fact that it takes away this original sin. We're not born sinners, okay? And it saves little children. That's what that's something that the atonement of Christ does. Okay. Now, like we've said, the fact that we're not born with original sin doesn't take away our personal responsibility. Okay. Because we're are free from original sin, we are free to act and we have to act. We either follow the enticings and the temptations of the devil, which is what the flesh wants to do, which is what the natural man tends to want to do because it's gratifying to the body. Or we follow the enticings of the Holy Spirit, okay, which is what we must do in order to be saved. Okay, um, we're going to our, uh, I believe this is the, I believe, yeah, this is going to be the last part where we go today. And this is actually out of the Book of Mormon. This is in the Pearl Great Price. This is in the Book of Moses. Um, and the Book of Moses is a great book. Okay, it's packed full of um, many amazing teachings. And I invite you to read it as much as I invite you to read the Book of Mormon. Okay, the Book of Moses is great. It's found in the Pearl Great Price. Okay, so we're going to read 53 through 57. Okay. <laughs> And it says, And our father Adam spake unto the Lord and said, Why is it that men must repent and be baptized in water? Okay, we believe that Adam himself um, was baptized. That's something we believe. And the Lord said unto Adam, Behold, I have forgiven thee thy transgression in the Garden of Eden. Okay, this harkens all the way back. To let's look if we click this, will it harken back to that? It should. Okay, it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, the church should update this link, and it should go back to that Second Nephi two scripture. I have forgiven thee thy transgression in the Garden of Eden. He had. He, he came. Christ came, and had redeemed them from this effect of the fall. Okay. Now they are free to choose, and. To accept the conditions of salvation, which is to be to repent and be baptized and follow the Lord, or to not. Okay, that is that part of the res the personal responsibility. Okay, fifty four says. Hence, came the saying abroad among the people that the Son of God hath atoned for original guilt, wherein the sins of the parents cannot be answered upon the heads of the children, for they are whole from the foundation of the world. Boom. How how much clearer can we get it? Okay. It doesn't say original sin, but it says original guilt. Okay. Take it as you want. I, it's the same thing. Um, so because God told Adam, okay, the Lord told unto Adam, behold, I have forgiven thee thy transgression in the garden of Eden. Okay. Hence came the saying abroad among the children of, among the people, that the Son of God hath atoned for original guilt. Okay, wherein the sins of the parents, okay, Adam's sin, cannot be answered upon the heads of the children, for they are whole from the foundation of the world. Okay. So this basically goes back to our goal of faith. We believe men are, men shall be punished for their own sins, and not for, the sin, uh, for Adam's transgression. Why? Because God forgave Adam's transgression. Okay, he took through the atonement of Christ, one of the mercies and the graces of the atonement that is extended to all people is the ability to be born without the original guilt, without the original sin. Okay, uh, 55. And the Lord spake unto Adam, saying, Inasmuch as thy children are conceived in sin, even so they begin to grow up. Uh, when they begin to grow up, sin conceiveth in their hearts, and they taste the bitter that they may know 
to prize the good. Okay, so you might say, but wait, it says conceived in sin. What does that mean? Does that not mean that original sin? Okay, so how I understand this, because it, it's not contradictory, okay? We don't, we're not born with original guilt. And it says, the sins of the parents cannot be answered upon the children, okay? So what I take this to mean is, because we all sin, we're not perfect, and there's sin in the world because of the fall. We can sin. Um, that your children are born in this environment, and them being free because we're we're free from the fall, um, from the the effects of original sin, and as Second Nephi two says, we are free to choose and to act and not be acted upon. It says right here, sin conceiveth in their hearts. Okay, because they're in this environment, because we're in the fallen world, sin conceiveth in their heart. Okay. And then it says, they taste the bitter, they may know the price of good. What, what, what does this mean? Well, I mean, when we sin, if we have, a, you know, a godly conscience, because some people have just gone so far off that it, it, they, don't, they don't feel it anymore, but we feel bad when we sin, okay? It's the bitter. And then when we don't sin, we, when we follow Christ and we follow God, and we, you know, we... Like, um, as it said, yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit. We we feel good, so we can we can know the bitter through sin, and it makes us want us to do good. Right? That's why I understand that. Twenty six, and it is given unto them to know good from evil. Okay, that sounds like Second Nephi two again. Wherefore they are agents unto themselves again, like Second Nephi two, and I have given unto them uh, another law and commandment. Wherefore. Teach it unto your children that all men everywhere must repent or in no wise can inherit the kingdom of God. For no unclean thing can dwell there or dwell in his presence. Okay? And then it says, For in the language of Adam, man of holiness was his name, and the name of his holy begotten Son is the Son of Man, even Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, who shall judge, uh, who shall come in the meridian of time. Okay. So, 27, the way it starts off, Okay, teach your children that all men everywhere must repent or they can no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Again, personal responsibility, okay? Thanks, thanks to Jesus Christ and through his grace, we are free from this original sin, right? So we don't believe in original sin. We don't believe that it's something that affects us because of Christ, okay? We're free from that part of the fall and we have the ability we're agents to ourselves we can choose okay we're not um crippled by a nature that makes us only do stuff bad okay now again the natural man what our body tends to want to do because the enticing of the devil are pleasing to the body because the you know the body's weak our the natural man in us just wants to do whatever we want and wants us to get you know instant gratification and all that so that is somewhat of living in a fallen world, right? That's what we're doing. That's a fallen nature. And that is an enemy to God. But we have the ability through this grace of Christ and what he did for us to choose. We can come, we can go into Christ and we can accept him freely or we can freely turn our back on him and accept and follow the devil. Okay. Um Guys, this is basically it. Hopefully it was understandable. To me, this is a really important thing to understand. And also, it's important to understand that the atonement of Jesus Christ um, has more effects than just wiping away our sin. It helps us be able to be in a state where we can come unto him and where we can repent and do um, these things. Um, it's an infinite atonement. And we'll get into that. There in the Book of Mormon it talks about how the atonement is infinite. And it is. And um I just wanna, you know, end by saying I love my Savior Jesus Christ. And I know that He did come to earth and He died for our sins. And that through Him we can be cleansed. And because of Him, we are free to act for ourselves. We're free to um like it says, choose Christ or to choose the devil. And I invite all to choose Christ. I invite all to yield to the enticing of the Holy Spirit. I invite all to read the scriptures, the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and to accept Christ. And um, 
that's what I that's how I want to end this video. If you have any questions, if something was confusing, please let me know. Um, leave uh, if you like something, please let me know. Leave it in the comments. Share this video with people um, and uh, leave me a like if uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. This is Read It Bomb. Um, and yeah, it's been great.